Great. Nice to meet you all again. Um, so um, what you'll notice in this course is that we're going to be looking at uh, lots of primary sources uh, in translation, as I mentioned. And we're going to embed our readings of those primary sources in our knowledge of the secondary sources that we read. I gave you quite a few of them, including especially Watt, because he serves as a nice background. And what, we'll do that, what that will do, the secondary sources will give us a kind of a, a historical uh, uh, locus for our understanding of theology. Because theology didn't happen, Islamic theology didn't happen in, in empty space. It, there was a historical context to it. There was a certain political dimension to it, a certain social and economic pressures. All of these things shape the way, the way we believe. So it's not, it's not just texts that determine uh, the creed of a tradition, of any tradition. Uh, and the texts that exist are not only informed by the political, social, and cultural environment, but they are also changing. So uh, in, in Islamic theology, for example, you'll see, especially the, in the early period, there are a lot of debates about basic principles of Islam. Certain things that Muslims today would not think would be uh, orthodox, for example, or would not be acceptable, were things that were debated as potential options that might have been accepted. There are also certain theological groups, such as the Mu'tazila, whom you'll meet, who actually were paramount and the more important, more important than the uh, Sunni uh, uh, theological tradition of Asharism and Maturidism that came to uh, hold sway in the tradition. Uh, there was, in fact, as you will see again, we'll place this historically among between the Mu'tazilis, which became among the Sunnis uh, a rejected and minor group generally, and the other two groups that I mentioned, the other theological groups, the, the Mu'tazilis generally held uh, were actually more powerful for about 400 years. Uh, they were the, the dominant group. And then certain uh, historical developments uh, caused their decline and caused them to be absorbed into the Zaydi tradition and to some extent in the Shi'i tradition, whereas Sunnism adopted a different theological position. So what I want to show in this course are basically two things. Right? One is I want to place theology in its historical context uh, because I want us as, as scholars, as uh, human beings, and as Muslims to realize that uh, generally creeds of any tradition are pluralistic. And when they become canonized, there's a historical reason for it. And the second thing I want to show is that even when things get canonized, even when they become solidified and crystallized as creeds and as positions, within the textual tradition, there are minor changes that keep taking place. Uh, I was talking to Fuad just a while ago. He has been reading a text, uh, an 18th century text by an Egyptian scholar uh, who's an Ashari. But his Asharism is not quite exactly the Asharism of earlier scholars. And if you look at Asharisms of those earlier scholars, they will see that they are influenced by Mu'tazilism and by falsafa philosophy and so on and so forth. So in other words, it's a very complex tradition from the beginning to this moment. Now, as you know, in this class, we're going to be looking mainly at what I call the classical period, namely the period of the earliest emergence of Islam uh, to the coming of the Saljuks, which is in 1050. Uh, in my view, more exciting things happen after that period, but we have 30 hours and three days, so we can't cover everything. Um, the other reason we can't cover the other stuff that I, that I find exciting is that it's really a work in progress for, for all of us who are scholars in the field because we don't know much about the post-classical period. It's something that we are just beginning to dig up um, and, and there's really exciting stuff there. Okay, so with that aside, any questions, any comments, objections? Question. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. That's an excellent question and and I'm um, periodization as you guys know is a problematic thing right I mean when does you know when does America become America and is no longer a British colony you know in, in its in its uh, you know not just with the Declaration of Independence but when when does it assume for example a particularly American character we can't date that right so so you're right so uh, I basically refer to uh, the classical period as uh, roughly from around 750 or so to about 1050. Around this time, we have a, a very, very important theologian whom we'll see, uh, uh, Ghazali. And with his intervention, theology really begins to take a very different uh, coloring, a very different uh, taste in the Sunni tradition. Uh, we'll look at a little bit of Ghazali and then the class will end. So, right, so this is the classical period and the post-classical would be somewhere, let's say 11th century, right? Late 11th century. In my view, in the Islamic tradition, the post-classical period continues into the early 20th century. And the reason I say that is that there are certain trappings of, of the post, so-called post-classical period uh, that are continuous with greater or lesser degree in various regions in the Islamic tradition, such as there's a continuity 
of uh, a pedagogical institution called the madrasa. Right? There's a certain kind of madrasa that emerges after Ghazali, which incorporates certain kinds of texts. And they're continuous in vast parts of the Muslim tradition. Um, so the madrasa, for example, uh, the, the way you write texts, the genre of commentary. Commentaries, shuruh and hawashi, are basically pervasive from this period all the way into the early 20th. Uh, there's some co commentaries that are still written, but by the early, early 20th century, as the madrasa declines, so does the commentary tradition. So I call post-classical that period generally, which manifests certain characteristics like the institution of the madrasa, the genre of commentary, networks of scholars that stretch transregionally from India all the way to North Africa and so on. All these things change when the coming of the modern age with the nation state and the boundaries that are set up. So this is my post-classical period. This is classical. Yes, before this, you can call it the formative period if you like. So thank you for that question. Uh, any, any other questions, comments, uh, corrections? Yeah. Oh, please correct, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's a student of mine writing a dissertation called uh, Muslim Theories of the Self in Modernity. I think, are we in modernity? I don't know. <laughs> and again, that also has the symptoms, right? The nation state, for example, uh, ethnic national identities that define belonging. Uh, so those kinds of questions, I think, have put us in a different age. Uh, the institution of the university. I mean, the way we learn, the texts that we use, the fact that you have standardized texts and you all sit in a sort of a strict curriculum. The fact that I had to give you guys a syllabus, that's modernity. If you were studying with me in the 15th century, there would be no syllabus. There'd be a loose set of texts that we would study different parts of and argue and engage, but there would be no strict, clear syllabus. So those kind of, that's modernity, I think. Institutionalization, systematization is what modernity is, I think. Some of the things that probably would have been that was done back then, we argue about today, but it wasn't argued about. No, it uh, they were argued about, but they were argued about sort of as uh, all of them were potentially correct options. So as you will see, there there is a minor group, as I mentioned, that uh, in discussing what the nature of God was, they are Muslims certainly, uh, was willing to propose that our way of thinking about the physical world is the only way we can think about it. That's the only existent, right? The only existent set of things are things that are physically manifest. So God must be like that. So and then they talk about God's throne, for example, and they say, well, it is in the seventh sky. It's a physical thing. It extends to infinity in this direction and this direction, but at the bottom of it is not infinity. You'll see these texts. You, you already have read it. And then God is, if you look very closely, becomes something like a, a cube that's also a pearl. Uh, and it's a very physical, I mean, they actually believe there's some kind of physical manifestation. Uh, that's, all, that's an option that was debated out of the tradition. That's, I don't think there might be Muslims out there who, who think of God that way, and, and they, I'm sure they have good reasons. But generally speaking, through the various arguments and, and reasons and debates, that option was sort of, you know, rejected. You said everything was potentially correct then. And now it seems like everything is like potentially wrong. Well, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> Um, well, because I think, I think we have forgotten the fact of the plurality of the tradition. Because uh, any tradition, when it becomes late, becomes, as I said, canonized and crystallized. It becomes a solid thing. And the possibility of engagement with its earliest uh, modes of debate uh, becomes lesser and lesser as we go later in time. Um, so anyway, so thank you. Um, any, any other comments or questions? OK, so I, what I want to do now is um, I want to say something about the sources of early Islam. Because what I'll do is I'll give a lecture, or I'll talk about early Islam, and we'll interject, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, and I hope. Uh, and that'll set, the, set up, uh, give us a setting for the emergence of theology. So some of it will be redundant from uh, the quick uh, lecture of, of 20 minutes I gave in the online session. Uh, but before I do that, I want us to think about what the nature of the sources are that we use to write about early Islam. Right, what is the evidence and what is the nature of the evidence? Because it's very easy to listen to somebody uh, who has written a text, let's say a secondary uh, uh, scholarship, whether the person is a Muslim or a non-Muslim, about early Islam. It's also very easy to read the Muslim theologians themselves uh, at a, from a later period, let's say 200, 300 years after the emergence of the theology, and to take that at face value. 
Uh, but the more difficult task is to think about what are the sources that these guys, the early theologians and we modern scholars are using to talk about early Islam. I mean, do we have sources available or is this stuff made up, right? We have to think about uh, the question of, uh, I mean, since we live, live in, a, in an unfortunate age, we have to think about how much of it is fake news and uh, <laughs> what is the basis, what is the found, what is the evidence? So, generally speaking, we don't have uh, uh, narrative texts, extended texts from about the first 150 years of Islam that have survived. We have reports in later texts about what earlier scholars may have said, uh, what events may have transpired, but we don't actually have those very texts themselves. So for example, you can go to the 9th century, late 9th century, early 10th century scholar, the famous Al-Ashari, uh, and he has a work called Maqalat al islamiyin which is a heresiographical work, which gives you the opinions and positions of various sects within Islam before his time, right? Now is he, and, and they're very short, they're pithy, you know, one, two paragraph statements about this group believed such and such a thing and this group believed, but we don't have the actual lengthy arguments and debates of those, uh, those uh, earlier schools. We have fragments. So we have to reconstruct. And that's uh, the most difficult task of early Islamic theology. So, and also in history, we don't have these texts. We have, for example, some archeological evidence that scholars are now just now beginning to engage, um, I think past, I would say 15 years or so. Uh, some archeology span is of course difficult and impossible because some of it, Mecca of course is a holy site and you don't go and start digging over there. So that's a difficult task. Uh, so there's some archeological evidence. Uh, we have some papyri. Uh, uh, administrative papyri, for example, from Egypt. Uh, so, you know, text written on papyrus that has survived and mainly survived because of Egypt's uh, environment. It, you know, it's uh, generally uh, dry and it's hot and those kinds of texts, those kinds of, um, that kind of material, papyrus survives. So we have some late seventh, uh, very few, but generally eighth century onward papyri that we can use to reconstruct, but reconstruct administrative history. How were the caliphs dealing with the regional governor? Or how, what kinds of commands was the governor given, giving to his underlings and so on? But it's very difficult. There are some juridical material, some legal material, some theological material that can be extracted from these kinds of engagements, from these letters and documents from the papyri for, that we have discovered from Egypt. But again, that's not going to serve much for theology. We also have relatively contemporary, very few outsider views on Islam, uh, written in Coptic, in Greek, and so on, Syriac of non-Muslims observing the emergence of this religion in its earliest phase. But of course, there are two problems with this. One is that we have to engage these texts with the same source critical attitude that we engage the Muslim sources. I mean, what are the limitations of these sources? Is that fake news? Are they representing what is actually happening? The other problem is even if those sources are representing uh, in, a, in a genuine and honest way, uh, the story of the emergence of Islam, they have an outsider's view. They're not in Mecca, for example. They may have heard reports about the emergence of a prophet, uh, about the first, second, third caliph, but they're not there. They're, they're actually outsiders writing about what they're observing of the emergence of Islam from their perspective. Muslims and Muslim armies, so on, coming to their lands. And then whatever they observe there, they write about it. So we, those are the kinds of sources we have. The only source we have, honestly, and, and scholars generally, even revisionist scholars, those who doubt the, the basis of any authenticity for the reports about early Islam in Arabic sources. Uh, the only reports, we, the authentic, really authentic document we have that we can really not argue against is the Quran. We have, for example, uh, 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 Quranic uh, fragments, not the entire thing, from Sana'a, for example, dated through uh, scientific uh, methods uh, in the 640s. So not very long after the Prophet's death. So he died in 632. So in, in 10, 15 years after that, we, we have some kind of a document that did exist. Um, and then by, by the middle, late, the latest, by the middle of uh, the 8th century, we do have some Quranic fragments appearing in greater and greater numbers. Uh, generally, all analysis that has been done, form analysis, material analysis of the Quran and so on, whatever fragments we have, does give us the sense that this was a text that existed at that time. There have been debates, for example, about the authenticity of various types of hadith and how hadith was collected and whether it reflects sectarian bias and so on and so forth. And those debates will go on. And they did Muslims actually engage in those debates. But the Quran, generally speaking, neither contemporary scholars uh, nor the Muslim tradition argues is that, uh, that, that it is collected later on. It seems that the story about Uthman engaging in the collection is a proper and true report. 
But unfortunately, from the Quran, you can't just extract much theology. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a discourse on theology. Uh, so uh, there, that's the limitation that we face when we come to the Quran. So how do scholars write these stories uh, or these narratives, which we hope are correct narratives, true narratives about what actually happened? I think in order to engage that question, I want us to engage in a little bit of an exercise that I give uh, some of my students when I teach early Islamic history or generally any course. And it's, it's a little exercise in, in what it means to write a narrative. Um, so uh, let's, I mean, I pulled this thing up from one of my classes and let's see if, uh, if it's a useful exercise, right? I'm going to enlarge this. I hope it's a fun exercise. <laughs> let's see. There are two images here. Uh, can you guys see it? Am I in the way? Should I move? I'm, yeah. Okay. Um, when you write a narrative, the early Islamic sources are not going to give you, you know, extended stories, you know, for you know, 200 pages of what transpired and what happened in history. What you have are people arguing, fragments of people arguing and debating and so on. And out of those little atomic parts, we sort of construct a story. So what I want us to do is think of this as an atomic moment, the one on the right, right? Uh, Rembrandt's uh, painting. Uh, and maybe you guys could you know, imagine this as a textual atom. Imagine this as, a, as just a little piece of text that you have received, that you have, that you have discovered about early Islam. And if you wanted to write about what's happening here, can I? Can you guys think about what's, what's happening on the right side? Well, that's, that's what scholars have to do. We have this fragment and that fragment and this little report and that little thing, and we sort of do our best to come up with the best explanation, right, a theory. So what, what is that on the right side? It's the light of an angel. Sorry? It's the light of an angel. Okay, but, okay so that, that's, a, that's a moment that you're describing. But if you're a historian, and this, you have discovered that on the right side, uh, and you have to write a book or an article, <laughs> right? You, you want to explain. If, let's say, let's say somebody tells you, "Well, this is a little moment from uh, a, the the uh, moment that's representing a, a little little painting that's representing a moment from the Hebrew Bible." That's all you know. Yeah. So, you, well, so what are the kinds of things you would do to? I would, yeah. I would, I would, I would try to. Depending on the, I would try to research the artist. I guess the artist. Would It looks more to me like it could be related to some type of revelation or something. Mm, okay. so I would look at, I would look into perhaps the religious or the idea of religion in that time, or what was enlightenment to them, or something like that. I would go ahead. Outstanding. Okay. I want, to, I want to actually, actually latch onto one thing you said. You said it might be some kind of revelation. It is a kind of revelation that's happening in there. But why did you go there? I'm just curious. The, the, the idea of the, the light, for one. That's, yeah. Um, th that's actually, out that's excellent. Um, what, what I would ask you, or, or anyone, I mean, that's, that's actually pretty close to what's happening, um, is that do you think you're working with some kind of a framework of what a revelation should look like? And what happens when you get a revelation? Um, I'm not, so what I'm saying is that you are placing this moment in a larger framework of your understanding. Um, and revelation came to your mind. I mean, let's say we had never heard of religion or revelation or revelation stories and light related to revelation. None of that, none of those symbols were associated. We, let's say we lived in a different kind of world. And all you knew, for example, were, were uh, let's say, physical theories and the Big Bang and so on. Your mind would probably never go to the notion of revelation. I mean, this you would interpret perhaps in some physical terms. You might say that, I don't know, some kind of a physical phenomenon is happening right now and, and these guys, an explosion, these guys are shocked. Yeah. So. Yeah, it could be anything, right? So, so what I'm saying is that when, when historians, even the early historians of Islam, early theologians, and we as, as later observers of texts and evidence, write a narrative, there's a certain framework with which we work. Now, your idea that we should also go back to the framework of the painter, 
that's what a scholar would do. I mean, a bad scholar would say, they would use their own framework and just read the whole thing through their framework. But you took the next step beyond that, and you uh, thought about what the painter might have, what kind of environment he may have looked, uh, lived in, what enlightenment may have meant to him, uh, what notions of religion were at that time. Uh, and uh, the conglomeration of all these things would produce your, your explanation, your theory about what this thing is, right? So that is what an scholarly enterprise is. But we have to keep in mind that this is just an atom, ato atomic moment, and you have to patch it together with other things to, to explain, to produce a theory. By the way, this is what also happens in science, what hard science too. We can talk about that later on. <laughs> but yeah. So I, I, would, I would ask a couple questions. Like, who are these, who are these people? You know, what are their names? Um, you know, this has to be, you know, why is he wearing that outfit? Right. You know, what's that on his head? You know, this has to be interesting because now you have women and men. Is that his wife right next to him? Is that his, is he clapping his hands? What was happening before this moment? Yeah, you great, know? great. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of before, right? So this is, as I said, it's an atom. It, you, know, you have to work with an atom, so you also have to not only pre place it in a theoretical framework of the author and yourself and so on, you have to ask a question of how does it fit in its own moment? What happened before? And this painting is not going to move and tell you. So now you have to, th there's lots of educated, informed, scholarly speculation and stringing together of evidence that goes into the production of uh, a, a classical source and a post-classical source and a contemporary scholarly secondary source. And that's what I want to bring to your attention. And this is why reading the primary source is very important. You know, you, we will look at some difficult texts in this course, uh, but I want you to, just as you engage this painting so closely, I want us to engage those primary sources out of which somebody like Watt is writing. I mean, he's, he's an ex outstanding, ex excellent scholar, or was. Uh, but he also has a historical method, and I, I don't want us to be naive about historical methods of any scholar, Muslim, non-Muslim, male, female, and so on. So other people on this side had some comments, yeah. I was just looking at the picture, the thing. The way I look at it, it's like there's things that you see immediately, but there's like something behind the, uh, the woman right there on the left, and what's that like behind it in terms of, is it just that amount of people, or is it a larger group? Right. I guess it's the idea that there are other witnesses other than the people that we're just seeing primarily. Great. What I'm also happy, thank you, what, what I'm also happy about is that it seems that, it seems to me that everybody's enjoying this exercise, which tells me that we as, as human beings, as scholars, as thinkers, have some inclination to produce stories out of what we see, right? Uh, time is continuous, atoms don't really, I think we're the kinds of creatures for whom atomic knowledge is not sufficient. We have to string it together to make sense of, a, of, of an extended time, an extended period. This is how we, I think, this is how we experience life. This is how we experience text. This is how we experience paintings and so on. We, so immediately our mind goes into some kind of a construction of a story. Uh, so thank you for that exercise. Any other comments or, yeah? I think um, like one of the approaches could be to look at, especially if you have um, uh, historians from that time period or close to that time period who wrote about that particular uh, artist mm -hmm. and you know what he was going through or what was going on at that time and then combine that with um, let's say if this form of expression is an actual school of expression mm -hmm. right people of that school come from that you know from that school of thought or who evolved from that directly from that school of thought will probably be able to give you you know, because that's an expression of something else. Thank you, yes. Now, so this actually is a great transition for me because I want to also say something about how contemporary scholars of Islam have thought about the nature of Muslim sources because this is where we're going. This One of the ways in which one scholar, for example, uh, uh, Albrecht Knott, uh, you don't have to know him, but I'll mention it anyway. So one of the ways he, he uh, thought about the nature of Muslim historiographical sources, sources that tell you about Muslim history, is that he says that there are lots of topoi in there. You don't read these sources always literally. Uh, for example, one of the topoi would be uh, that you see always in the sources that when Muslims, for example, engaged in battle, the first thing they would say would be, 
Allahu Akbar. Yeah, this is in the early sources. You say Allahu Akbar and you, and you advance. So he, for, through various very interesting arguments, he said, well, this is actually uh, a way of speaking. This is, this, is, this is alluding to something else. This may be alluding to the fact that they are encouraged, but they didn't, probably didn't actually say all of them Allahu Akbar before they engaged and so on. So the point that he's making is that you have to read these sources, many of them not literally, but as insofar as they point to some other fact. They're symbolic. Uh, similarly, another scholar, Tayyib al-Hibri, uh, argued that when you look at early Muslim sources, uh, uh, there, there are lots of allusions to other kinds of symbols that appear in other texts. Uh, because the source is supposed to be read by an audience, right, by, by a set of addressees. And those addressees have a certain set of uh, uh, tools. This says, you know, what's your name, sorry? As, as Tariq did, right? He had a certain framework with which he was working, a framework of, let's say, of revelation, right? Because you can fit this one into that framework. So uh, the readers have a certain set of uh, tools, instruments, you know, mental instruments, frameworks, and so on, symbols that they recognize. And Muslim sources are actually often alluding to those symbols. So for example, there's a very interesting story about the companion Talha ibn Ubaidullah. Uh, he was buried in Iraq. And one of the stories is that his grave uh, had been filled up with water. So when it was dug up, they found the color green, things, green things, and, and so on growing. And now, I don't know what the source means, but number one, do we take that literally? Did his grave, grave actually fill up? Did they actually then dig it up? And did they actually find something green or not? We'll never know. But we do have a text that's stating this. So how do you read this text? Well, the color green is in Sassanid, uh, pre-Islamic Sassanid uh, uh, literary traditions, is associated with royalty and nobility, right? So the text may be saying that Ubaid, uh, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, a famous, you know, famous close companion of the Prophet, had some kind of elite status with the Prophet in Islam. Right? So the readers would recognize green because they are coming from that background. They would see this report about green. They probably wouldn't have taken it literally. We shouldn't either. And then what, what the text is really saying is that it's making a statement about the elite standing, you know, important standing nobility of Talha in relation to his faith uh, and, and to his Prophet. So this, these are some of the ways in which, and of course, these are not, these are not arbitrary, arbitrary things that the scholars have said. They have you know, looked at other texts and they've seen, well, the green color comes with reference to graves and these, 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 and these sources. It might be that this is the framework through which this text should be read, a Muslim text should be read. So you don't take it literally, it's actually saying something else and so on. So, so those kinds of, there, there are lots of very interesting works on early Islamic historiography. You know, the nature of the historical sources that we, that we read. And those uh, secondary, some of them, you know, outstanding ones like Tabul Hebri, Note, and so on, and then many others, uh, make us a little bit more sophisticated in our reading of the sources. We're, we're, we are no longer naive readers. We don't, you know, it says, you know, that the prophet went such and such a place, and he said such and such a thing. We just don't always take it literally. We, we actually engage other sources and other frameworks and think of what could this possibly be saying to its own readers in its own time. But, but, but there's people that take it literally. Sure, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, but that too. I mean, we, if, if we're going to be charitable, we're going to. We have to think about that reading too. The sort of rigid reading is also a framework, isn't it? I mean, it's. it's so what they have is a, a, a general thesis, that in, and this is actually a thesis you can act, you can actually trace back to usul al fiqh works, right? That in the absence of indicants, in the absence of uh, uh, contextual clues, that a certain statement should not be read. Uh, uh, should, should not be uh, uh, read, uh, led, read literally, uh, the default position is always that you take it literally. Um, so that too is a framework, right? That's a theory of literalism. And what I'm presenting is uh, also another theory based on another set of evidence, which itself has been analyzed into a theory. Um, so, so I just want all of us to be cognizant of this fact, that there are these embedded frameworks that are informing each other. and. Uh, this is, this is why scholarship is fun too, because it's a detective game. You, you know, once you stop taking things literally, you become a detective and you can spend your whole life uh, engaging uh, you know, two or three topics and digging and trying to figure it out. Yes?
look at this mm -hmm. and take the conclusion right away, I got it, and then you're, you're done. Mm -hmm. You don't think about what was the time and context of the author and the, of the, of the, the writer, what was the history around it. And you know, so these things get exacerbated by, I'm a literalist. Right, exactly. Yes, my principle might be yeah. in the absence of evidence, but because I'm literate, as soon as I see it, I don't even look for any more evidence. Yeah, that, that can happen too, of course. <laughs> and I stop looking. So this is it. And if you don't agree with it, you know, you're doomed. Mm -hmm. Yes. And often, often, th that's very nicely put. I'm going to quote that someday. Blind to our own normativity. Excellent. Um, the... Uh, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there are layers of frameworks, right? So, for example, I gave this position of literalism. A literalist would also say, well, this is the position of a shayukh from the past. Now, and that's fine. But I think a person who is not blind to his normativity would say that that too is a principle. That's a principle of taqlid. It's a theory. And where did I get that theory, right? Um, or if you say, for example, I'm going to do tahqiq, I'm going to investigate further, and I'm going to peel the layers and see whether this is a literalist or non-literalist, uh, this, this, this statement deserves a literalist or non-literalist position, that too is a theory, right? So once you become aware of the higher order frameworks and theories with which you operate, everything actually, one, one thing is you feel liberated, you feel, oh yeah, this is all a historical process that's happening, and I'm part of it, and I have my, uh, you can also, be, so you can become liberated, but you can also become sort of uh, uh, rested away from your moorings. You, you, often don't have a platform anymore, which, which uh, you can become very pluralistic, but to others it might seem you become arbitrary too. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so, anyway, it's, it's, this is what happens. All right, great. Um, yes? What I find to be so interesting about all of this is that it's finding that balance of you're not free falling, but you're also not like, you know, kind of hardlining. Yeah, and I think, I mean, uh, if I might, you're right. I mean, this is what happens. But um, I just finished actually a paper, which, I, which I'll, if anybody's interested, I can send them. It's going to come out in the journal Orients. It's called Under Determination in Usul al Fiqh. So the later Islamic theorists, and by later I mean, you know, eight, the text I was looking at was 18th century onward, uh, were, were aware of the fact that if they dig deep enough into their usul, into their principles, each asl, each basic principle for deriving law is itself grounded in another asl, which itself is underdetermined with respect to itself, but it r r needs grounding with reference to another asl, and so on. So in, in many ways, their system, though they said the legal system is valid, it's not a certain. You cannot have yaqeen or certainty with respect to the system that I'm presenting to you as a legal scholar, but it's valid because each position in it is determined in relation to another position, which with respect to itself is underdetermined, but determined in relation to another position and so on. So they think of these things in terms of systems. So, and this is why I think before the advent of modernity, uh, the Muslim scholars actually, in my view, used to be significantly more sophisticated and pluralistic and open. Uh, because they knew they were able to see not just what they were doing, but also step outside of their system and see the system and recognize that this is, this is a consistent system, but not necessarily certain and absolute um, and so on. So, so with that, uh, any other comments or questions? You, you have more you comments? You we have 10 hours, guys, so we're fine. <laughs> 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 But you just mentioned something. You said the advent of modernity. In, in, in discussions that I've had, that I've had, that I've been having since I've been <laughs> a student at at at, 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 at um, this advent of modernity uh, sometimes is discussed in a way as if it was forced upon Islam. But modernity mm -hmm. is something that's going. It's it's the natural movement of evolution. Sure. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So. It's not so much as Islam has to catch up with it, and, and, and it's never been a question for me, is Islam relevant? 
you know, uh, and we stick to the core principles of what Islam represents, because this is where I get confused in, in the philo philosophical. This is where the confusion comes in for me, in, and I want to understand it better. But modernity is not an enemy against Islam. No, I certainly wasn't. Uh, no, if, not that you oh. that, but when you said that, I've heard this in the separate from the advent of modernity, like as if it was something that came to come and get Islam or, or attack Islam. But no, Islam has the ability to actually <coughs> manipulate modernity as it is as it is, as it is, you know, involved in it. You know right. I think what, what I mean, what, what the great thing that happened with modernity in the Western tradition is that it led to post-modernity, right? So it, it, it led to a certain kind of internal self-reflection on our systems of the way we think. This is why you have, you know, philosophy, for example, in, in the Western tradition has now become a philosophy of mind and philosophy of language. You, for example, in the, in the modern and pre-modern period, in logic, you would have rules of derivation. If A is B, B is C, therefore A is C. What philosophy does now, analytical philosophy, is that it thinks about the principles whereby those rules can themselves be justified. So it's a higher order thinking, which again, as I was saying, sort of frees you up. It sort of gives you a bird's eye perspective. On uh, uh, what, what seems to have happened is that modernity itself, which was a way to post-modernity, was taken uh, by Islam. And, which, and I agree, it's, it's, Islam was evolving with it. But I think Islam's reading, or Muslims' reading generally of modernity, was that it's some kind of a rigid system. And it seems that even though Muslims and Islam, Islam is, is, was part of modernity and part, part of most post-modernity too, I think it took too many of the trappings, ironically and paradoxically, too many of the trappings of modernity to define itself, as opposed to remaining free from it. I think Islam got too embroiled with modernity as opposed to sort of remaining true to its uh, earlier sort of system-based uh, higher order thinking uh, of the sort that I was describing. So in, in my view, actually, the, the situation is the reverse. It's not that, the, that modernity is the enemy of it or that Islam was not engaged in it. I think it got too engaged in it so that it got stuck in it. And it, and it took its frameworks and institutions uh, and forget its, forgot its own freedom and it's forgot, you know, it canonized itself. Um, one last thing, I'll give you an example of this. And I, 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 wanna, I know you're anxious to say something. When in colonial India, we're going completely off topic, but again, we have 10 hours. <laughs> in colonial India, one of the ways in which uh, the British courts ran, and these British courts would implement or use Islamic law to pass judgment in Muslim cases, one of the ways they ran is that they canonized, uh, they translated, and then by the process canonized, the Hidayah of Marghinani, which is a famous fiqh work that you guys, I'm sure, know about. Uh, this became something like a code. No fiqh work in the Islamic tradition is supposed to be a code. And then Muslims in India embraced this notion. The Hidayah became extremely, they read the Hidayah and they read the Waqaya and the, you know, the, the various commentaries on it throughout the tradition, but it was in being engaged through the process of commenting and engaging you know, and criticizing and agreeing and so on uh, for centuries. But once you canonize it and put it in a book and, and you present it to the judge, and this is the, this is the text that we use with reference to precedent, uh, precedent because we're a nation state and we're, we're systematized and we're, we control and we are controlled uh, by certain specific frameworks, uh, that's when you have embraced modernity too closely. Uh, uh, and then you've forgotten uh, the fact that you cannot canonize fiqh texts. They're not meant to be crystallized, not supposed to be solid things, they're supposed to be moving. So this is what I meant by you know embracing it too tightly. Okay. Yeah, and back to you. Unless you've forgotten, I hope you haven't. Yeah. All right, so I'm not thinking of modernity as the now. I'm thinking of it, I'm thinking of it, and again, I'm thinking of it, and it may be, you, every, people can debate. Each time, mm -hmm. the time that they're in, they see this, this is the modern time. So I, this is somehow better than this time. And that goes on over and over and over and over again. So I think what we're, I, I agree with you. What was happening here is that I think we are working with two terms. One is the modern, which is every time is, of course, it's modern time. Modernity as an expression, again, it refers to certain uh, symptoms. 
you know, the, the, a formal nation state, for example, with specific boundaries, papers and documents that you need to prove that you belong. This is partly, by the way, the, the, you know, one, of the, one of the problems with uh, Muslim displacement and migration in the modern age. When nation states are formed in this, at the end of the Second World War, many people who work on, worked on lands um, owned by various elite and had been working on it for centuries, were their, their papers were asked for. And well, you, you didn't used to have, there are no documents in paper, This because this is not how it used to function, which means then you are no longer a part of modernity. You are, you don't, you don't belong in the land anymore, for example. So there are certain trappings, you know, docu documentation of your being as belonging somewhere, the nation state, the institution of the university, bureaucracy, uh, all these kinds of things. Uh, uh, th this is a, what I think of as modernity, a very specific set of symptoms. Uh, but you're right, of course, every age is modern in relation to itself. Yeah. I think there was a hand here. Um, and what's your name? Sorry. I should ask your names each time, but and Yasmin. Yeah. Just, yeah, I was just going to make the same thing that modernity is not just the contemporary period, but it's a, it's grounded as a project method or an approach that emerged out of the Enlightenment. Yeah. Right? And, and you know, I, I speak to my uncle is a scholar of Islamic studies, and you know, he's very passionate about certain things. And so, this I'll I'll, I'll attribute this observation to him because it's not mine, uh, and now I've embraced it very very strongly. Uh, there are certain conceptual frameworks that come out of the Enlightenment that are again specific to Europe, and within those conceptual frameworks, the project of Islam doesn't quite fit. So, for example, this question that people keep asking me because I happen to work in this field the tension between Islam and science. And there was no tension. I mean, yes, there, 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 were some, there, were some, there was some pushback, of course, as in any tradition. There were people who were, some people who were persecuted, but overall the ulama, the actual people who actually worked on law and theology and so on, were also astronomers. And they were also, they, they were the astronomers. And, and they were the guys who wrote works on mathematics, and they were the guys who wrote works on philosophy. <laughs> So this, because it was something, it was a broader framework of inquiry. So, but in the post-enlightenment age, we have, you know, this emergence of this notion of the secular scientific world and the religious world. And so, of course, the question is pertinent to Europe or, or the Western world or post-Western enlightenment. But it's a question that, does, it's a conceptual framework that doesn't work with Islam. And people ask me, so why did the decline happen? And I say, what, which decline are you talking about? How do Muslims, uh, you know, fall, how, do, how is it that Muslims, in, you know, overcome, or how can they overcome this tension between religion and science? And I keep telling them this is, I historically I haven't seen this tension. Yes, again, there are people and historically and contemporary age that have some issue with science, but Islam never had, seems to me, never, as a historian, never, never seems to have had a real problem with science. Um, and secondly, I don't know what is meant by science anyway. Does it mean the empirically based a method, or does it mean a method that's based in rational thinking, on the base of certain rationally produced principles? Uh, because science was very different uh, before, in fact, the advent of the 20th century. Let's say 19th century, mid 19th century, and 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 the and the strong hold that empiricism has uh, had developed before that. Science was a much broader exercise. So, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so if you guys are engaged, uh, interested in this further, you can, for example, go to a very late, in my, in my world, it's a late text, a mid-19th century text called Abjad al-Ulum. Uh, it is a classification and compendium of various sciences, and it also quotes earlier classification and thinking about knowledge. I shouldn't say science, it's, it's about the ulum. Uh, so how did Muslims over, over a long period used to think about where the different disciplines fit into the larger enterprise of gaining knowledge? Where, where does astronomy fit and where does... Uh, 
theology fit and so on. Uh, it's not been translated, but I know some of you read uh, Arabic. It's called Abjad al Ulum. Again, it's nothing groundbreaking because it's quoting earlier authors, and but it has its own position on various things. And it's by a uh, scholar called Siddiq. That's my Macron, Siddiq Hassan Khan from India. Um, and that's a good place to start. And if you, oh, actually, I, I forgot. I wrote an article on the classification of sciences. So anybody interested in that, <laughs> I'll just forward that. It uses a lot of that text. OK, back back on track now then. Thank you for that very, oh, no, wait, final comment. No, no you but well, we can do one more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you go to uh, the traditional scholars in most of these countries that I've studied at, like Morocco or Egypt or uh, Yemen or Syria, the traditional scholars who are pushing a particular or you know who hold a particular position, medhab, mm -hmm. theological position, they kind of talk about their systems in a way that is not binding. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, they say this is wajib or this you know. You but it's not like this is this should be institutionalized uh, by the state. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, it's like the opposite. They'll say, you know, and they'll you know they always quote you know uh, Imam Malik and you know, Harun al Rashid or, or these type of things where they say like you know trying to institutionalize your position, your specific position, has always been frowned upon. At least people I've been exposed to, um, and you know the state is kind of like this entity that kind of comes and goes and might change and, and things like that, but we try to keep our sense of identity. And the other thing is that they weren't afraid to take a position. Mm. You know, the scholars wasn't like this thing where you, you, there is a plurality of valid opinions, but this one makes the most sense to me. And I'm, I'm standing on that, and I'm refuting, I'm refuting the other ones through reason and principles and so on and so forth, but I respect the other position so long as it's principled it comes with some sort of logic as well as revealed uh, sources. Um, right. And I think, you know, maybe part of the problem is that we're, we're looking, like you were saying, at this from a mod modernist mindset, where it has to be kind of almost absolutist uh, discussion where it's either right or wrong. Um, and so we look at tradition somewhat like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so that's just Thank you. That was a very valuable set of comments. And if you, we can talk more about this too with reference again to usul fiqh. Uh, there's something called ijma murakkab, which we can talk about, which I think s stands as a ground of this kind of sense of broad plurality, system system uh, system determined plurality within the tradition. Uh, so we can. Uh, everybody ready to move forward? Back to topic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. No, but th this was. I mean, I know we went went off topic a little bit, but uh, this was uh, certainly uh, a. A relevant set of where is my uh, relevant set of discussions uh, because I think it it gives makes us more sophisticated thinkers about Islamic theology.